Satan said, this time you've done it. Now you've gone too far. How could the Lord receive you? You're ruined now and scarred. But something deep inside of me said, Child, you're still my own. And, and my love for you is still the same. So, child, just come back home. He gave me more than I ever asked for, more than I ever dreamed. He gave me more than I could imagine. When I came back home to Him When I asked Him to forgive me He gave me a robe and a ring I said, make me as one of your servants But He made me a child of the King I thought about the years I'd wasted as I walked the homeward way. And I rehearsed time and time all the words that I would say. But when I finally climbed that last long hill, my father I did see running with his arms open wide in love to welcome me. He gave me more than I ever asked for, more than I ever dreamed. He gave me more than I could imagine when I came back home to Him. When I asked Him to forgive me, He gave me a rose. I said, make me as one of your servants, but he made me a child of the King. When I asked him to forgive me, he gave me a robe and a ring. I said, make me as one of your servants, but he made me a child of the King. Of the King. Um, we still have a lot 
at least one unspoken request uh, for our congregation. Uh, and I'm sure that there are, are others. Um, continue to remember Terry Green from Victory Baptist Church uh, because of his car accident last week. Uh, but he is home, he's out of the hospital, so uh, we're, we're praising the Lord for that. He's just not moving very well yet. Um, Mavis is here. She had some issues last week. Um, so we're thankful for that. We want to remember um, one of the, our community members here, Kay Clatt. I don't know if you know Kay or not, but uh, she was uh, one of the singers in the Harmony Express. Uh, you probably all heard the Harmony Express at one time or another. Because uh, she's uh, having some difficulty, um, especially with her voice right now. And so we want to make sure that we um, pray for her. Um, Tammy Dunn is still um, suffering from the effects of cancer. And we want to remember, too, uh, Jim Craig, who is Karen Ross's brother. Uh, he had a heart attack this week, so we want to. Remember him, he was in ICU, so, uh, but he's out of ICU now, thankfully. So, we have a lot of people to pray, pray for today, and so keep those on your list of people to call, to or talk to. Pray about them. I'll get it right here in a second. <laughs> okay, so, we're going to sing a song first before we pray. I'll sing, Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, follow me now. And Bob, would you mind bringing me my water? Um, it's right there in front of you. I forgot to bring it up. My brain is not totally functioning yet this morning. Yeah. Uh, you're at the right it's a common problem around here, I think. <laughs>
Let's all stand and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all that you do. And Lord, we call on your Holy Spirit to be with us just now, Lord. For you have the power. Your Spirit has the power. And it's the same Spirit, Lord, that raised Jesus from the dead that we have available to us today. The same Spirit. For Lord, you said you never change. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that goes for the Holy Spirit as well. We thank you, Father, for your goodness to us, for all the blessings, Lord, that you have provided for us. And I pray just now that you would be with each and every one of these prayer requests that we've mentioned here today. Lord, you know each and every heart. You know each and every problem. And you also know the solution. And I pray, Father, that you would be with each one. Be with our unspoken requests, Lord. It seems like we always have a bunch of unspoken requests. We pray that you would touch each one of them. Continue to pray, O oh Lord, for uh, Terry Green at our sister church, Lord. We thank you for his work. I pray, Father, that you would be with him just now. Continue to touch Mavis, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen her. Be with Tammy Dunn, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would also be with Jim Craig, Lord. Touch him, Father, as he's just undergone this heart problem. I pray, Father, that you would touch him. Strengthen him, oh Lord. Heal him, Lord, completely. Lord, you are in each and every one of these situations. You are already there. You already know what's going on. Lord, we didn't even have to say them to you because you already know who they are and what their needs are. Lord, I pray that you would be with each and every person here in this place. All of our relatives, all the travelers, all those who are not with us just now, I pray, Father, that you would be with them. I pray too, Lord, for, for Susie, for she's not feeling well, either not able to move around too well. I pray, Father, that you would touch her. Father, you're so good. And we thank you for being here. Thank you for your presence in our lives, Lord. And thank you, Father, for this day that we can all come and worship you in God's house. The Lord, while this is not God's house all week long, it is here this day because your church is here inside each one of us. And as we gather together, Lord, we pray, Father, that you would help us to learn from you, to hear from you in both the singing, singing word and the spoken word, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would be with us. We ask it in all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
cross. Everybody loves the old rugged cross. So I like to throw this in once in a while. Go ahead.
but uh, this is also about the blood of Jesus because we're going to partake of the blood and the body here a little bit. But we want to remember about the blood.
morning, everybody. Good morning. So 
So uh, that's what I want us to talk about, is, is, our, is the divine proximity to our lives and our lives to the divine, and where, what, what that proximity basically is. Now it's important to note that right from the beginning, this uh, proximity issue is initiated by Jesus himself. It starts with his incarnation. We didn't go to heaven. He came to us. And so he's the one that entered into our world. He's the one that wanted to close the gap in proximity. He wanted to be more near us. And so he left heaven. There's a lot of scripture you can find. Philippians 2 that talks about all that he went through, of course, to be able to leave the heavenlies and come and have a human body. The incarnation, of course, the, the uh, virgin birth and all that sort of thing. All of that, and as well, interesting enough, the name that is given to him, and I don't just mean the name Jesus, I mean the name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Okay, so that in itself, the name is talking about proximity change. God once was in heaven, God once was distance. Maybe God was in the tabernacle, was God in the tabernacle and in the temple, but now he is with us. And that becomes definitive of him. His very name speaks of the, the, the purpose, intentional, wanting to be uh, in a close proximity to our lives. Amen? Amen. It's really what's so cool about the whole thing. Well, we're going to look at Luke chapter 5, but even before that, if you recall, Luke chapter 4 has to do with, that begins with Jesus being tempted in the wilderness and confronting, uh, being confronted by Satan and Satan back. And then immediately after that, if you go to verse 15, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to record it for you. Jesus then leaves the, the wilderness and goes to Galilee and there he begins to teach in the synagogues. He went to there, he went to, the, to Galilee to be with them. He went there to fulfill his name, God with us. Right? God can't be with us unless he goes to Galilee again. He initiates not only just the incarnation, but the, the actual personal presence of him in Galilee, verses 18 through 30, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth, which is where he grew up. And there, in his own hotel, there, he, uh, he brought his personal presence. He, again, fulfilled the, his name, Emmanuel, God with us. Um, in verses 31 through 37, Jesus goes to Capernaum, and he teaches in the synagogues. Emmanuel, again, God with us. He takes his, his, his personal presence there. Verses 38 through 42, Jesus goes to Simon's house and heals his mother-in-law. And for the balance of the day, he also heals a lot of other people that come. Again, the impact of God with us. Verses 42 through 44, Jesus says to the people, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities. For I was sent for this purpose. And there he departs and goes to other cities. Again, Emmanuel, God with us. So he's initiating this change of proximity, God from the heavenlies to God right personally in front. And that's where we take off on um, chapter 5. So if you would go there with me, we're going to just uh, read verses 1 through 11, and we'll walk through it exegetically. Before we do, Lord Jesus, we come to your word this morning. We pray that it will have its touch and its impact upon our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning and, uh, and call us to something fresh and new in our relationship with you. And we just ask your touch by your spirit and by your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, verse, uh, <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 5. It came about, now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. And, um, excuse me, I had a bend in my paper here. And when he had finished speaking for a story, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. But at your bidding, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners and the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats 
so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that they saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you'll be catching men. And when they brought the boats to the land, they left everything and followed them. Now, you all of us are familiar with this portion of Scripture. We've all heard, probably heard sermons on this. And probably the majority of the sermons that we've heard, or at least I've heard, has been focused on this great miracle that transpires. And the fact that they have this wonderful catch of fish and so forth. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of messages in a portion of Scripture like this. What I want to do this morning, though, if you would with me, is allow me to allow this to be kind of a stepping stone of proximities. And that's what I want to focus on. So we're not going to look at the miracle and the fish and all the boats and so forth. But what I want us to look at is this kind of progress, this process that is taking place where Jesus' proximity to the people, specifically to Simon, changes over a period of time. And so if you would with me, go back to verse 1. And let's read that again. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. We'll just stop there for a moment because you've got a multitude who's formed. Jesus is teaching. Now, it doesn't actually say that he's teaching in this thing. He said that they were listening to the Word of God. So I just want to know what he was teaching was the Word of God. Um, I don't want to just go over that lightly. I want to take just a moment to address that. Uh, if you recall with me, Jesus later in the Gospel of John says, whatever I hear the Father saying, that's what I say. Whatever I see the Father do, that's what I do. This is this is not scribal. I don't even know if that's a word. Is that a word, Harry? Scribal? Scribal teaching where the scribes would sit down and unroll the scrolls of the prophets of, and the Pentateuch of the law, and they would then teach out of that whole thing. This is not scribal teaching. This is the Son of God receiving from God himself his words, and then he's giving those words to these people. Okay? It's the Word of God. It's really what all of us want. Amen? I mean, really, when it comes down to it, you guys gather here on Sunday morning, and, and I come here you know, as well, and, and one of the things I think you hope for, and I hope for whenever I'm in a church, is that I hear something from God. Right? I, that's what we want. That's what we long for. It's what our souls long for. You know? And it's, it's a little different than, let's say, a PhD or a college professor that's kind of explaining the prophets or explaining the law. It's a little bit different than that. This is about an individual who's actually sharing what God is saying to these individuals. And if you want to know why the crowd rose, it's because of this. It's because God's word is being spoken. So even as it's being spoken, this multitude that's gathered gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, I don't know what your experience is like whenever you hear the Word of God personally, intimately, where God speaks to you, but usually for me it's something like this. Ah! That hit me right where I am. Anybody relate to that? I was like, ah! How did that guy know that? You know, that just nailed me right where I am. And sometimes that's a painful thing, but I absolutely love it. Amen? And uh, sometimes it's an encouraging thing, sometimes it's an exhorting thing. It has different manifestations, but every time you know that in that moment, that is not that person, that is in fact God who is speaking. That's what this multitude is experiencing. And as a result of that, more people are hearing from God for where they're living at that moment, and the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If you can imagine the because the image is really, you know, he's, he's there at the side. Let's say that this is the... Uh, this is, well, let's say, we'll, we'll make this the crowd, okay, back here is the lake. And so Jesus is teaching to the crowd here, and as he preaches and as he shares the word of God, people gather and gather, and of course, what do they want? These are individuals that, that want the front row. <laughs> I don't say anymore. <laughs> They actually want the front row. And so the crowd, as it gets bigger and bigger, wanting to get closer to Jesus, all of a sudden Jesus is backing up, and he looks maybe around the back of him, and there's the lake. And pretty soon he's going to be swimming if he doesn't do something. 
Okay? That's verse 1. Verse 2. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, man to Jesus. Turning around, looking at the lake, looking at the crowd, watching the crowd move closer and closer, get bigger and bigger. And then he starts looking on the sides and he ends up finding two boats. Two boats right there on the edge of it. But the fishermen got down and they were washing their nets. Now the other synoptic gospels, they recorded the fact that they were tossing or throwing their nets. And in fact, that's part of the process, is throwing the nets out in order to get whatever fish scales and everything is on them and drag them in and throw them out again. So this is a, this is a parallel portion of that. They're in the process of washing the nets. We'll discover later that they're washing the nets because they've fished all night long. So imagine with me if you can, these fishermen have been out fishing all night long. They're now, they're now home. They're, they're, the boats are at the edge, somewhere near the edge of the hole, and they're now doing the last thing that they have to do in order to go home and catch a nap. Right? <laughs> go to bed. They're, they're probably exhausted. Right? It's not too close like at the edge, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and they were washing their, 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 uh, their nets. Now, I don't want to miss this because though they were washing their nets, and this multitude is probably, I mean, I don't think Jesus is very far away from this. I don't think he had to walk a half a mile to get to the boats. I think they're really close. And it is, it is my conjecture, and that's all it is, that probably why they're washing these nets. They're listening to Jesus. I mean, I would be. If I was standing at the Sea of Galilee and washing nets, and a crowd kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and Jesus kept raising his face and put his voice louder and louder, at some point, I'd start listening. Am I the only one? Yeah, yeah I think we all would. So they, if, if he's, if they're listening to this is all that we got. All right. So he gets into one of the boats, verse 3. He got in one of the boats, which is Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the, from the land. Okay, we're going to stop here for a moment and talk about the first proximity. Okay. Uh, the first proximity is what I'm going to call the shoreline proximity. We're taking notes. Not to worry about it. Shoreline proximity. Okay. This is the proximity where Jesus is standing before a crowd, and a crowd is gathered, a multitude is gathered. There he's speaking the word. It's a good proximity. We call it church. Right? That's what we call it. People gather, the ones that are called out, the, the called out ones, they gather together, and there Jesus speaks with his church. And there through gifted individuals and individuals that he, use, he uses prophetically, he brings his word to their lives. It's short life proximity. It's a really safe proximity. Jesus is there. Multitude is over there. The word's being spoken. There's an appropriate personal distance between everyone. It's a really safe place. And by the way, I love short life proximity. I love church. I love gathering with all the other people to hear from the Lord. Why the only one? <coughs> yeah, we all do know it's, it's, it's a part of our, our lives. We, we love There's nothing wrong with it at all. Now, Peter is on the very skirts, outskirts of that. He's barely a part of that proximity. But he's there. So you have this wonderful multitude of people that you're fellowshiping with. You have the word of God that's being done and spoken and so forth. And, and you're experiencing God in the midst of a crowd of people. Church. It's wonderful. It's church. Is it God with us? Yes. Absolutely it is. Every Sunday morning. That's why we gather here. Amen. That's why we gather. We don't do it out of habit. We do it out of the desire to be with each other. And the desire more than other thing to be with Christ. To hear from him. Okay. But, then, but then we get to verse 2 and 3, and specifically verse 3, and he got into one of the boats, which is Simon's. Now the proximity changes. Simon's gone from being on the outskirts of this multitude of people, this shoreline community that's gathered, and now Jesus has gotten into his boat. Simon is no longer just part of a crowd or on the edge of that crowd. He's now in a very different proximity to the Son of God. When you say he's gotten into Peter's boat. Now some people might struggle with that sort of thing when Jesus goes from being a part of the crowd to actually getting into your boat. I mean, some might, some might have a little bit of concern. 
not that whole thing. And then, and then it, he doesn't only just get in the boat, but can continue there. He asked him to put out a little way from the land, and he sat down and began teaching the multitude from the boat. That's a whole other thing, too. I remember, Harry, I don't know if you ever did this in all your, all your preaching years, but I remember in my young years, when I was stupid, okay, I thought it would be clever for me to step down off the platform and, and sit next to a person and continue preaching the message. That individual that I did that with was absolutely miserable. <laughs> they could not take that close of proximity. <laughs> that is exactly what Jesus is doing. By the way, I never did that again. I, I, because it really was a dumb thing to do. It was clever, and it was fun, but it was dumb. All right? So that's exactly what Jesus does. He gets into Peter's boat, he, he sits down in his boat, and he, he continues to teach. Now, Peter's not the other of the crowd, but Jesus, Jesus, you know, over here. Now, Jesus is right next to him, preaching the word of God. Follow me? That's Jesus getting in, into his boat. Okay? Does he ask permission to get in his boat? No. No, he does ask him to put out of it. He just gets in to his boat. There's no request. He just takes his liberties, gets into Simon, Simon Peter's boat. Well, why does he do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. There's one, the crowd. That's a good reason. But I would suggest to you there's a second reason, and that is this simply. He wants to have a closer proximity with Simon. And so getting into his boat allows him to do that. And I guess before we even go any further with the message, I would ask this question. Is, is it okay? If Jesus gets into your boat, would that be okay with you? And when he does get into your boat, are you going to be all right with him? Are you going to be one of those that go, hey, this is this is my boat, man. You have no place here, no business. I don't mind you in the crowd, but now you're in my boat. Now you're in my life. And, and remarkably, Peter's okay with this. Peter's going to say, you cross the line, get out of my boat. Go find somebody else's boat. Peter's like, okay. And when he asked him to put out a little bit, Peter doesn't go, no, I'm sorry, I'm tired. I just finished washing my net. I'd rather not do this. He does it. And when Jesus begins to preach, Peter's impacted. Profoundly. So he, he, he's, he's okay with it. And I guess... The question this morning again is, are you okay if Jesus changes his proximity to you? Are you okay when you leave here today that he gets into your boat? That he comes in and takes a closer place in your life than you're experiencing right now? And that means one-on-one, -on -one, you and Jesus. That does not mean a multitude in Jesus. It means one-on-one. -on -one. If you can, go to Luke chapter 19. And uh, we have a similar kind of event that happens. There's a man named Zacchaeus. You guys know who Zacchaeus is? Of course you do. Everybody knows. You know the Sunday school, you know who Zacchaeus is. Okay. Starting, starting in verse 1. And uh, Jesus, that is, he entered and was passing through Jericho. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So not only just a cheap tax collector, which is, you know, but he's crooked as a barrel of sins. He's rich, too. He's made great money on this. And he was trying to see Jesus, and uh, who Jesus was, and he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature, and he ran out ahead and climbed up the sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was uh, about to pass through that way. And when he came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry, come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him. And when they saw, saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to the guest of the man who is a sinner. Okay. Now, Jesus crawled up the sycamore trees. So he didn't see Jesus. Jesus comes by and looks up at him and says, I'm coming to your house today. Zacchaeus say, Nope. No, he's, he's gone from Jesus walking in the midst of a multitude on the way to, to Jericho to 
Jesus being in his house. You guys follow this? Zacchaeus is okay with it. We're going to discover as we go along, Zacchaeus' life has changed dramatically because of that. All right. Well, here we go. Oh, by the way, I, I, I want to give you uh, uh, Revelation chapter 320. You guys all know that probably. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man opens the door, I will come in and I will dine with him. And he with me. This is Jesus standing on the outside of the church, knocking on the door, trying to change proximity. He wants to come in, have that have intimate proximity with his church. And the door, he has to knock on. It's locked. He can't get in without them letting him in. My fear is, is that there's a bit of the church today that is experiencing. All right. Verse 2 through 3, if you wouldn't me. I'm sorry. Uh, 4 through 8, if you would. There we go. Verse 4, and when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break, and they signaled to their partners to the other boats for them to come and help them, and they came and filled the boats, and they both began to sink. All right, so we have the shoreline proximity, which is Jesus in the midst of the crowd, speaking and the, the words of God. We have the boat proximity, Jesus getting into your boat. Well, this one I'm gonna call the business proximity. That's Jesus getting into your business. All right, and that's basically what he says, put out, yeah, Speaking verse 4, put out into the deep waters and let down your nets for a catch. This is Jesus not just getting in your boat, but getting in your business. Now, I don't know about you, in his particular case, his business is fishing. Well, that's not my business. I don't do a lot of fishing. Unless I can do some deep sea fishing, which I really enjoy. By the way, the biggest fish I ever caught was nine feet long. <laughs> Sorry, a little bragging. I apologize. Uh, but I'll tell you what my business is. My marriage is my business. My family is my business. My finances is my business. The stewardship of other people's lives is my business. My property is my business. This is my business. And Jesus wants to get into my business. It's not enough for him to be in my boat. He's, you know, Karen and I pray over every meal and pray together. He's a part of our home and so forth. But he wants to be more than just in our home. He wants to be in our business and everything that we do. And what I have discovered, as Peter discovered, or Simon discovered in that moment was, is that he will ask you to do things in your business that makes no sense at all. Let down your nets. We fished all night and caught nothing. You want me to love an unlovely individual? You want me to love my enemies? You want me to forgive those? Did you say seven times 70? Are you sure about that math? You want me to turn the other cheek? You want me to, to go and preach the gospel? You want me, you follow me? That's my business. And he will speak things when he gets into your business for you to do that makes no sense at all. And yet in the obedience, and that's what Simon eventually does, is he obeys. And so in verse 5, Simon answered and said, Master, we return all night, God, nothing it makes no sense what you're asking me to do. But at your bidding, I will let you do this. He obeys what he thinks is absolutely crazy. But because Jesus has gotten into his business and given him advice regarding his business. He does it anyway. I can still remember my father sitting down at the dining room table in our, in, in our home in, in Tucson. And at that time, he was a contractor. At that time, he was building houses by the blocks, and he wasn't making any money. I mean, he was just barely making it out. And, um, and so he sat down at this across the table, and he said, he said uh, I have two things to say to us as a family. Uh, I'm going to make I'm going to make two changes for, for our lives. And we all went, okay. The 
wondered what was going to happen. So the first thing is, I'm no longer building houses by the block, so I'm going to build one house at a time. It's going to be a custom built home. And the reason I'm going to do this is because this is what God told me to do. And we all sat around the table thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to go from building 10 or 12 houses to building one a year. That sounds crazy. And then the actual, we said, what's the second thing? So the second thing is, I'm going to start tithing my business work, not just my income, but the business as well. And we're all like, well, the business isn't really making any money right now. Why would you do that? Because Jesus told me to. And so he did. Okay. Ten years later, he retired at 55, a wealthy man. And the Lord blessed him, prospered. It didn't make any sense. It wasn't logical at all. But he was obedient to what God called him to do. It doesn't always make sense what he tells us to do when he's in our business. But if he tells us to do it, we do it in whatever... Whatever is supposed to happen will have happened. Whatever will occur in this case, two boats full of fish. Okay. So, number one, he wants to your business. Number two, he wants to tell you what to do with your business. You okay with that? Okay. Number three, he, uh, he often tells you what to do with your business that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then finally, number four, you have to do what he tells you to do. It's just about loving. Whether it makes sense or not, you have to do that. What if Simon had said, no, nah, not going to do it. Sorry, fished all night, exhausted, washed the nets. I want to go home and take my nap. I'm done. What well, would he have lost? Two boats full of fish. The experience of America. Something that made no logical sense, no, no natural sense at all would occur. He lost that. What if the man who was born blind got halfway to the pool of Siloam and said, No, I'm, I'm done with this. Somebody give me some water, I'm just going to wash the mud of my eyes. He would still be blind. A lot of the things that Jesus asked people to do made no logical sense whatsoever, but because they obeyed, because they did it, they got the mirror. Then they got it. They're mirror. I'm always a bit nervous when the Lord calls me to something that makes sense. I'm sorry, but my experience so far with him has been a lot of the stuff, the big stuff that he's ever called to me, didn't make any sense at all. Planting churches are, is not a logical thing to do. It's a miraculous thing to do. Right? That's what it is. It's a miraculous thing. Loving your enemies is not a natural thing to do. It's a miraculous thing to do. Tithing is not a natural thing. It's not a logical thing. But it's the miraculous thing to do. And the ones who have experienced the, the ones who have actually got to experience the miracles are the one who did the thing that made no sense at all. If I just crawl through the crowd on my hands and knees and touch his garment, I will be healed. All you have to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. It doesn't make any logical sense. But I understand the power of the sovereignty of God and the miracles that come forth through that sovereignty. Well, we go back to, uh, to uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 7 through 10 on Zacchaeus, and you will discover that because of his obedience and because of I'm sorry, because he opened up his house to let Jesus stay at his house, we discover soon on that Jesus not only just comes to his home, but he gets into his business. Because, because Zacchaeus says to him, for all the people that I have defrauded, I will pay back, pay back four times what I defrauded. You see that Jesus has now given him commands to do things that only happened because he got into his business. And to a tax collector, a, ch a cheap tax collector, a crooked tax collector, something dramatic has changed. Has changed. Okay. That's what happens when Jesus gets into your boat. That's what happens when Jesus gets into your business. All right, verse 9, can we go there back to uh, Luke 5? For amazement, uh, oh, verse 8, uh, when Peter uh, saw that he had fell down to Jesus' feet and said, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man. Now we have a profound 
intimate, personal impact on the life of sight. He knows who Jesus is, and he knows who he is. Our verse 9 for amazement and season, and all of his companions because of the catch of the fish they had taken. So also James and John, the son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, for now I will be catching men. Look at verse 11. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything in the front of them. And I must have missed this. We've got the multitude, the shoreline proximity, the multitude of people. They get to experience the word of God brought to them. We have the boat proximity, where Jesus gets into Peter's boat and is now one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. We have the business, in your business proximity, where Jesus now gets into Peter's business. I don't want you to miss this one. Because this, this next one is, is not Jesus getting into Simon's business. It's Simon getting into Jesus' business. And he sees the two boats filled with fish and almost sank. He sees this incredible catch of fish. And he sees the opportunity for him to leave that business and go into Jesus' business and leaves the boats, and leaves the fish, and leaves the nets, and follows Jesus. Okay. I want to encourage you. So I, I, want, I want you to understand that the leaving of your business for a moment to get into Jesus' business does not mean you have to leave what you're doing right now. It doesn't mean you have to change occupation. It did for Simon. It does not for us. But what it does mean is that in whatever moment is needed, when I'm with someone, when I'm having coffee with someone, when I'm with Karen, or when I'm with a family member, or with whatever I am doing, in that moment, if, if I will allow it, I can allow, in that moment, Jesus' business to happen, and not mine. In that moment, I can abandon my business, and leave my boats, and leave my fish, and leave whatever it is that I'm doing in that moment, and I can go into Jesus' touch people's lives because Jesus' business is people. You know? So it is that kind of uh, choice of proximity change. I want to do more than just be a part of the shoreline. I want to do more than just have them in my boat. I want to do more than just have them in my business. I actually want to be in his business. And at any moment, at any time, you can be in his business. The invitation is not just to Simon. It's to us. Come, and in this moment, let's catch some men. Let's do some of our miracles. Let's feed some thousands of people. Let's do this. And I get to set aside whatever the business is that I do every day and get to be a part of this business. Amen?
I warn you ahead of time, he may not ask permission. He may just get his Lord. You may have to lock the door to keep him out. Because it's his intention. He came here to get in your room. We're going to take communion in a few moments. And that communion is the price he paid so he can get into your boat. And he can get into your business. And you can get into his boat. And you can get into his business. That's the price he paid for that to be able to happen. He wants to be in your boat. He wants to be in your business. He wants so much more. He wants to be involved in all the things that you're doing with regards to your family, your marriage, your single life, you know, whatever, whatever stage you are in, whatever you're engaged in every day, he wants to be a part of that. And he wants you to be a part of what he's doing. He wants you to be in his business as well. You know, it's just, there's only one, one other proximity that, even, that, that I would say is greater than this, and it's and it is the Great Commission. Go you know, and therefore make disciples of all men, baptizing and immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to catch what he says. And lo, I will be with you always to the end of the earth. And that, that kind of proximity only comes with disciple makers. Individuals who are making other disciples. That's an incredible proximity. I will be with you always. Lord God, as we, as we sit here this morning, we pray, Lord God, that, uh, well, first, a prayer of thanksgiving uh, for all that you did to come onto our planet, to, to come with your intention of, of being with us, God with us, Emmanuel. All of that you initiated, all of that you started because you loved us so very much. And then, Lord, even as we consider this morning the, uh, the elements and consider communion this morning, we, we remember, we recall, Lord God, what price you paid, not only for you to come here in regards to proximity, close proximity through your incarnation, but the price you paid for us to come in, into your life. And be a part of you, reconnected, restored relationship because of the brokenness of your body and the shedding of your blood. Wow. Wow. How can we not let you in? And so this morning, before we even take communion, we just want to step, step aside just for a moment to say we welcome you into this church. We want you here, Lord. We want your words to be spoken in this place. We will come here each Sunday hoping to experience God's word, your word, spoken to our lives. We welcome you to the boat, to our boat. We want you to get into our boat, get into our lives. And Lord, do whatever you want to do in our, our lives for the betterment of others. We welcome you, Lord God, into our business. And Lord, we, we are committed to do whatever it is that you call us to do. Multiple facets, way of, a, aspects of our lives. And it's just reflected in so many different ways. But you can get into those. We give you permission to do that. And Lord, we long to be a part of your business. So we pray for that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen.
I said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take this, share it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. From now until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. And God, again, we, we thank you for this remarkable gift that you gave given to us, the gift of your Son, and all that he accomplished for us to be restored in relationship with you and to be able to do right with you. I live in a world where people are living lives <clears throat> without you and we're living with you, the craziness, the insanity, and we have this privilege and honor to be able to do right with you Amen. in every moment. Thank you, Lord God. We give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May you be richly blessed as God gets into your boat and gets into your business. And you get into his business. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There are waste baskets um, at the back and on the side here if you want to deposit your uh, little cups. That would be fine. Thank you. You are dismissed. Thank you. Okay, what, what, walking together.